Amelia Mosley and you're watching BTN. Thanks for hanging out with us again. Let's see what's coming up in today's show. We find out about the history of the minimum wage. Learn why our favourite treats are in short supply. And follow the incredible journey of a young soccer player. All that soon, but first today to a very important part of the United Nations. The Security Council was created to quite literally bring about world peace. Obviously, that job is far from done, but recently we've been hearing a bit about the Security Council, so let's find out more about it. Throughout history, all around the world, there have been many conflicts and wars. But what if there was an organisation dedicated to bringing about world peace? Oh, there is. Welcome to the United Nations Security Council. Its main aim is maintaining peace and security around the world. It's one of the six main bodies of the United Nations, which was created after World War II, when people were really keen to never have a war like that ever again. The Security Council has five permanent members, which were all the major victors of the Second World War. Ten countries are also elected as temporary members of the Security Council for two years at a time. Together, those 15 members have the power to make decisions that other UN member states are bound to follow. And if they think it's necessary, they can order things like travel bans, economic sanctions, ceasefires, even occasionally sending in soldiers. It's obviously fairly rare, but in 2011, the Security Council authorised the use of force in Libya when the Arab League requested that a no-fly zone be imposed over that country. I shall put the draft resolution. Big decisions vote. like this always come down to a vote. And that's where things can get complicated. Permanent members have what's called veto power, which means they can stop a decision or resolution from passing with just one vote. And that happens quite a lot. After all, these countries don't always see eye to eye. Which is one of the reasons why this was such a big deal. Will those in favour please raise their hand? Those against? Abstention. The draft resolution has been adopted as Resolution 27-28-2024. Last week, the UN Security Council passed a resolution demanding an immediate ceasefire in Gaza for the rest of the month of Ramadan so that aid can be delivered, along with the unconditional release of all hostages being held. It's the first time the Security Council has called for a ceasefire since fighting began in Gaza after the militant group that leads it, Hamas, attacked Israel in October last year, killing more than 1,200 people and taking more than 250 hostage. Since then, Gazan authorities say that more than 32,000 Palestinians have been killed. Without aid, hundreds of thousands more are facing starvation. Which is why many world leaders and humanitarian groups have been calling for a ceasefire. Now more than ever, it is time for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire. It is time to silence the guns. It's something the Security Council has voted on several times, but every other time it's been vetoed. In contra. Against. Usually by the US. It's always different factors. So, for example, um, you know, failing to condemn Hamas, for example, um, was one complaint with one of the um, resolutions that was put forward. This time the US decided not to vote, which meant the resolution could pass. It's a very important step that the United States, who is a very powerful actor in international relations and who has usually protected Israel uh, from consequences at the Security Council, is potentially no longer willing to do that. So does this mean the fighting will stop, at least for now? Well, probably not. Unless the Security Council makes another decision to enforce its demands, it's up to Israel and Hamas to decide whether they're going to listen. Hamas has reportedly welcomed the call for a ceasefire, but it wants Israeli troops to leave Gaza and return displaced Palestinians. Israel says it can't stop its war against Hamas until all the 134 hostages still being held are released. 
I hope we will do it with the support of the United States, but if we have to, we will do it alone. Although the UN's resolution alone won't be enough to stop the war, many are hoping it will create pressure on leaders to work towards a lasting peace. A cargo ship caused a huge bridge to collapse in which US city last week? Was it Baltimore, Chicago or San Francisco? It was Baltimore. The ship lost power and ran into one of the bridge's pylons. At least six road workers were killed, but police managed to stop other traffic just in time. Many of the vehicles were stopped before they got onto the bridge, which, uh, which, which uh, saved lives in a, in, a, in a very, very heroic way. Which big Australian music festival has just been cancelled for this year? Is it Blues Fest, Splendour in the Grass or WOMAD? It's Splendour in the Grass. It's one of the country's biggest and oldest music festivals. It's been going since 2001. Splendour is our equivalent of Coachella or Glastonbury. But this year, organisers cancelled it just seven days after tickets went on sale. A social media famous animal friendship was broken up when wildlife authorities removed what sort of animal from a Queensland home? It was a magpie. Molly the magpie and her best friend Peggy the dog had more than two million social media followers. She was rescued as a chick and raised alongside the bull terrier, but last week authorities removed Molly because magpies are a protected species and can't be kept as pets. And hundreds of millions of Hindus around the world have celebrated Holi, which is also known as the festival of what? Lights, candles or colours? Happy Holi! Holi is the festival of colours. It's an ancient Hindu tradition that marks the beginning of spring in the Northern Hemisphere and honours the triumph of good over evil. You've probably heard lately that things in Australia are getting more expensive. And to keep up with rising prices and help struggling families, the government's pushing for a rise in the minimum wage. What's that, you ask? Jack has the answers. Please, sir, I want some more. What? Please, sir, I want some more money. More money? Me? Oh, oh no, oh no, where are you going? I was happy to negotiate. In fact, I think it is about time we paid our workers more, perhaps a minimum, minimum wage. wage. Yes, it does have a nice ring to it, doesn't it? As its name would suggest, a minimum wage is the, uh, minimum wage. You can legally be paid for doing a certain job. Basically, if you are in Australia, are 21 or over, and not a trainee or apprentice, you can expect to receive at least $23.23 an hour, or $882.74 a week. Huh, I don't know about that. This is 1890-something after all. Minimum wage has existed in Australia for some time. In fact, Victoria was the second government in the world to introduce it back in the 1890s. At the time, Australia was going through a severe economic depression, and there were massive strikes across the country, with workers campaigning for fairer pay and better working conditions. In Victoria, the government did an investigation and found that, yes indeed, there was a problem with pay and working conditions. And so, in 1896, the Victorian government introduced a minimum wage for factory and shop workers. You get more money, and you get more money, and yes, you get some too. The other states soon followed suit. And in 1904, three years after Australia became Australia, the federal government passed the Commonwealth Conciliation and Arbitration Act, which allowed for minimum wages to be set for certain industries at a national level. This pipe can go over there. If we move that... Oh, no, 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 don't run away. I was going to ask you something. Do you like the whole minimum wage thing I introduced? Yes, sir, I do. Great! But... But? Oh, well, ever since you made the changes and introduced minimum wage, the cost of living has gone up. Plus there's inflation, shrinkflation... Yes, I'm aware of the flations. 
Over time, the minimum wage is adjusted to reflect things like inflation and the cost of living. For example, 20 years ago, it was just $11.80, but today it's nearly double that. While that might sound like a big increase, the government says that thanks to the cost of living crisis, many people are finding it hard to make ends meet. We don't want to see uh, workers on the lowest pay go backwards. Last week, it asked the Fair Work Commission, which is in charge of setting Australia's minimum wage, to increase it again. But not everyone thinks it's a good idea. It's safer if inflation goes down rather than wages go up. You see, if wages rise, businesses have to give more of their profits to workers. And if their profits aren't that high to begin with, that can have a big impact. Plus, if people are being paid more, it can actually drive up inflation and make things more expensive. Attention workers! I'm glad you've all taken the news of the wage increase as well, but uh, now we have no money, so... You're all fired! Oh, what? All of us? Any changes to the minimum wage will happen in July this year. Aww. So, in the meantime, the government and the Fair Work Commission will be weighing up their options to get this delicate balance just right. Oh, wait, wait, wait. We can't fire all of you. <sighs> can't we go back to the days of free labour? Aww. Oh, well. For a while now, we've been hearing a lot about the promises and the dangers of AI. Lots of experts say we need to bring in laws to control what can and can't be done with artificial intelligence. And now the EU has made a major step in that direction. Michelle can tell you more. Keeping up with everything going on in the world of AI can be a little overwhelming. Saudi Arabia wants to join the AI race. Just last week, Elon Musk said he was going to open source Grok. This is going to be as big as the internet, or possibly bigger. It's going to be, and many people have compared it to fire or electricity. It is a very transformative technology. And while it's exciting to imagine all of the ways this sort of technology could be used in the future, it can also be, well, a bit scary. When we live in a world where any image, any video, any audio, anything you read online can be fake, well then there's no more reality. And how do we live in a society? How do we combat climate change? How do we combat um, injustices in the world? How do we have open and free elections if we can't agree on basic facts? Someone else will. We've already seen examples of generative AI being used to make politicians say things they didn't say. But that's when I saw it, a glowing pistachio. And there are big concerns it's already being used to influence elections around the world. Which is why experts and lawmakers have been working hard to come up with a way to keep people and democracies safe. We have a duty to recognise this potential because it is going to be the technology that will be driving us into the future. Recently, the European Union's parliament became the first in the world to pass a set of comprehensive laws designed to regulate artificial intelligence. The regulation works in a tiered system, where the riskier the AI, the more regulation it gets. Some AI is classed as being low risk or no risk, like a spam filter for your emails, or AI that controls the actions of NPCs in a video game. Then there's AI that's considered high risk because it could impact real people, whether it's used in transport, in education, in government or law enforcement. A lot of what it does certainly makes a lot of sense. So they have um, the high risk tiers of certain kinds of systems and then systems that may pose unacceptable risks um, that may be banned. Um, so for example, systems that can be capable of superhuman persuasion uh, are, are, are considered bannable systems. Superhuman persuasion means the ability for AI to influence human behavior and decision making. Citizens living in the EU will also have the right to know whether they are interacting with an AI system, such as a chatbot instead of a human. Live facial recognition technology will be heavily restricted in public places, and all AI technology will have to fit the requirements for what the EU now calls trustworthy artificial intelligence. 
Off the back of this act, the US led a resolution at the United Nations to encourage countries to safeguard human rights, protect personal data, and monitor AI for risks, while recognising the potential of AI to make the world better. We're resolved to bridge the artificial intelligence and other digital divides between and within countries through capacity building, increasing digital literacy, and other actions. It was backed by more than 50 countries, including Australia. And some are hoping it'll be the start of a safer online world. Our regulators have to protect us. The same way the regulators protect us in the food we put in our body and the medicines that we take and the airplanes we fly in and the cars we drive in, they have to protect us online. Now, if you're like me, there might be a bit more chocolate around your house than usual at the moment, but around the world, there's actually a whole lot less of it. Experts say we're in the middle of a global cocoa shortage and it's driving up chocolate prices and maybe even leading to lighter Easter baskets than usual. Sass looked into it. Hello, this is the Easter Bunny complaint line. Thank you for your call. Please hold the line. Hello, this is the Easter Bunny complaint line. Thank you for your call. Please hold the line. More complaints. It's not my fault. Have you seen the price of cocoa? <laughs> if your Easter egg basket wasn't quite as full this year, there's a good reason. The price of chocolate has gone up around the world because we're in our third season of a global cocoa deficit. Cocoa is the key ingredient in chocolate. It comes from cacao trees. Farmers pick off these big cacao pods, take out the cacao beans, which are then roasted and ground to make cocoa. Chocolatiers mix cocoa with milk and other ingredients like sugar to make, you guessed it, chocolate. The trouble is, there aren't enough cacao beans to keep up with demand. The price of cocoa is going crazy. It's very worrisome. The cocoa that we get from them has dropped by a third of what they can supply. And also, that means that their price has doubled. More than two thirds of the world's supply of cacao beans come from Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana in West Africa. And both of those countries have been facing a lot of problems. Some of them are environmental, like climate change and an El Niño weather event, along with various diseases that have been killing cacao trees. The parts of the world where really a vast amount of the chocolate that we consume comes from, and um, they had extremely heavy rainfall later, uh, late last year, and now this very early, very unseasonal heat wave that damaged the crops even further. There's also the issue of deforestation. Rainforest is sometimes cut down so that cacao can be grown. But as the rainforest disappears, it affects the local climate and makes it harder to grow cacao. Illegal mining in Ghana is also having an impact on growing conditions for cacao trees. All of this means the price of cocoa has more than doubled in five years. And that's led to more expensive Easter eggs. <laughs> There are things happening to try and resolve this cocoa shortage. The Ghana Cocoa Board, CocoBod, is working to rehabilitate disease-ridden cacao farms and has set up a task force to try to find ways to protect cacao farms from the impacts of mining. But some say that's not enough. If we don't stop burning fossil fuels now and also invest actually in, in adaptation and making, uh, and making cocoa plantations more resilient to deal with these, uh, with these extreme heats, the price of cocoa will increase and cacao chocolate will become much more of a luxury product. Some people say that chocolate should be more expensive to reflect its true cost to workers and the environment even if that means having to cut back a little on our favourite tree. 
Hello, this is the Easter Bunny complaint line. Thank you for your call. Please hold the line. For fans of the Jack Jumpers, I think it's safe to say it was a pretty good weekend. Tasmania have done it! The island has its title! They've just won their first NBL title, beating Melbourne United 83 to 81. Listen to it, man, it's crazy. Early on, things seemed promising for United, who stayed in the lead for the first three quarters. But it was Jordan Crawford who helped catapult the Jack Jumpers in front with an incredible 32 points. Over in the A-League women's comp, it's Melbourne that's had cause to celebrate. Melbourne victory claimed, well, victory against Sydney FC, demolishing them 4-0. Meanwhile, City have defeated Perth Glory 2-1 to clinch the Premier's plate, thanks to a slick debut goal from young Matilda's captain, Shelby McMahon. Oh my goodness, Shelby McMahon! And finally to the Czech Republic, where snowboarding history has been made. 19-year-old Jakob here has just pulled off the world's first triple flip off a rail on a snowboard. Yeah, I think we need to see that in slow-mo. Whoa! Finally today, to a winner of the Takeover Melbourne competition, which asks young Victorians to share their stories. Adiba tells us about her love of soccer and how she had to leave her home country to be safe and follow her dreams. Check it out. It's been incredible having the World Cup in Australia. The energy is completely wild. Sometimes I think about what would have happened to me if it weren't for soccer. I play in Victoria's State League and tonight we're training for Sunday's match. I love being a defender, stopping goals and attacks. But it felt like more than just a position to me. I am a defender in other parts of my life too. I am from Afghanistan and in 2018 I was selected for the National Afghan Women's Soccer Team. Security issues and social norms made it very difficult for women and girls to play sport, but I still got to play. Everything changed when the Taliban took over. In 2021, they entered Kabul. I was told that I had 30 minutes to get to the airport. I didn't know if I would ever see my family again. I was terrified the Taliban would kill me. After four days without food and water, Australia accepted my team and I, and we boarded the plane. I was united with my teammates. With the support of Melbourne Victory, we now play as AWT, the Afghan women's team. We wish we could play for our country again, but FIFA won't allow us to compete as a team in exile. We will keep training and fighting for our dreams. When I think about all those girls I left behind, they can't go out, play sport, or even get an education. That's why I must work really hard. I represent thousands of girls. Well, that's all for today and for this term. We'll be taking a break for a few weeks, but News Break will be here as usual every weekday, keeping you up to date. And of course, you can jump online whenever you like to see more stories and specials, and you can check out BTN High. Thanks for watching, have the best holidays, and I'll see you soon. Bye.